The term real-time strategy didn't even exist when Jurassic Park hit theaters, but it would come to dominate PC gaming by the end of the decade. And that is thanks to two iconic studios, Blizzard Entertainment and Westwood Studios. The competition between them would define the first golden era of real-time strategy games, but only one studio would survive the conflict. So with that, let's get into it. Now, I ended part one of this series with the Populous franchise, which was developed by Bullfrog Productions. Populous hit the Amiga in 1989 and was followed by Populous 2 Trials of the Olympian Gods in 1991. These god games, as they were called, used attractive graphics and mouse driven interfaces to enable complicated real time strategy gaming. Now, Dune 2 would take that a step further. Developed by Westwood Studios and published by Virgin Interactive, Dune 2 was the game that set the template for the RTS genre through the rest of the 1990s. Though lacking in multiplayer and a mission that Blizzard Entertainment would use as an opportunity, it was a fresh, frantic, and fun take on strategy gaming. Now today, Westwood Studios is probably best remembered for strategy games, but Westwood Studios as it existed in the early 1990s seemed like kind of a strange fit for the genre in some respects. A 1993 article in Computer Gaming World, based on a tour of the studio, said up to 20 of the company's 50 employees were artists, and described its office as part studio, part gallery, with, quote, portraits, landscapes, still lifes, and a rather unusual sculpture, dominating the second floor. But that isn't to say Westwood Studios had no experience in strategy games. Its Crescent Hawk series of Battletech games were quite popular in the late 1980s, at least by the standards of strategy gaming at the time. Still, the studio's decision to design a real-time strategy game seems to be born more out of disappointment than love for the strategy genre. Brett Sperry, a co-founder of Westwood Studios and producer on Dune 2, would tell Edge magazine the game was inspired, quote, partly from Populous, partly from my work on Eye of the Beholder, and the final and perhaps most crucial part came from an argument I once had with Chuck Krogel, the vice president of Strategic Simulations Incorporated. Sperry elaborated on that a bit in a GDC panel in 2010. And uh, the basic bet went something like this. <clears throat> he said, nobody wants to play strategy games. And I said, well, no offense, but the reason why nobody wants to play your strategy games is because they're really, really boring and you're not doing them really new. You're not pulling anybody into the, the real meat and the guts and the fun of what it's all about. Sperry wanted to design a game that used modern interface advancements to spice up the strategy genre, and that, I think, was really the brilliance of Dune 2. The game's real innovation was how it paired those mechanics with a responsive interface that made frantic, real-time play enjoyable for the first time. It proved that strategy games could be just as action-packed as arcade games, something a lot of strategy game designers had for years sworn just was not possible. Dune 2 earned positive reviews upon its release, won a few Game of the Year awards, and sold fairly well, moving about 250,000 units through 1996. You might assume that it would lead to an immediate shift in the strategy genre, but that's not quite what happened. Magazines reviewed it well and then moved on to talk about other games. But still, Dune 2 caught the attention of a small young studio in California called Silicon and Synapse, which you probably better know today by its current name. Blizzard Entertainment. Yes, my Lord. Founded in 1991, Blizzard Entertainment was looking to expand its library after making several console games like The Lost Vikings and Rock and Roll Racing. In 1993, the studio would give Patrick Wyatt, who had joined the company as a programmer in 1992, the role producer and the task of leading development on a new strategy game, a first for his career. Wyatt was a massive fan of Dune 2. He was such a big fan, in fact, that he used screenshots of Dune 2 to create placeholder art for early development of Warcraft because the artist was not immediately assigned to his team. He wanted to make a game a lot like Dune 2, but also resolve a few of the things that he saw as weaknesses. Of course, Wyatt didn't get to make decisions like that in a vacuum. Blizzard president and co-founder Alan Adham had his own ideas. He envisioned a series of realistic historical war games that would all be sold under the name Warcraft. This would create a sub-label similar to the SSI 
gold box Dungeons and Dragons role playing games that were very popular in the late 1980s and early 1990s. If this had happened, maybe it would have looked a bit like Close Combat, a popular real time tactical game developed by Atomic Games and published by Microsoft in 1996. However, meetings through 1993 made it very clear that Wyatt had his heart set on doing a strategy game in a high fantasy setting, and Adham relented. Better unit selection was one of the first key improvements made to Blizzard's Warcraft strategy game. In Dune 2, you had to select every individual unit and give them commands individually, which could become quite time consuming and frustrating, as you might imagine. Warcraft would let players select multiple units, up to four, by pressing the control key and then using the mouse to drag a box around units. The maximum selection of four units, a restriction primarily caused by pathfinding AI limitations at the time, meant that large armies were still a chore to move around, but Warcraft was really about small squads of perhaps a dozen units at most, so it worked out quite well. And in any case, it was a big improvement over Dune 2. Blizzard also added a feature that everyone in the studio was desperately craving in that game, and that's multiplayer. Implementing this proved to be a real struggle, however, due to desynchronization bugs that plagued the team all the way up to launch. Wyatt and another programmer, Bob Fitch, noticed the issue when one of the early test multiplayer games crashed. The crash was not a surprise, but when the two met to brag about how well they were doing, they soon realized they had an issue. Their games were completely out of sync. They were both winning on their own screen at the same time. This desynchronization issue just proved to be a huge problem for the Warcraft team. It had no single cause, and they were squashing bugs related to it all the way up to launch in 1994. In fact, they even considered possibly canceling the multiplayer feature altogether. Warcraft Orcs and Humans was released in November of 1994 and received very little press attention, although it did receive a four-star review in Computer Gaming World. Still, the game's multiplayer action led it to sell a fairly impressive 100,000 copies in its first year. This was due partially to the spawning feature, which allowed one disc to be used for multiple computers over a local network. Blizzard's Bill Roper would credit spawning as a reason for the game's slow but steady success throughout 1995. While Blizzard was working on Warcraft, Westwood Studios was developing its own successor to Dune 2. Sperry was very sure that the studio should come up with some sort of follow-up to that game's success, and planning started in 1993, almost immediately after Dune 2 was released. Westwood decided to abandon the Dune franchise for an original setting, a decision partially driven by licensing fees and also partially driven by a desire among the studio to work on its own original ideas. Westwood released its own original adventure game, The Legend of Carandia, just prior to the release of Dune 2, and Carandia's sequels would be developed simultaneously with Command & Conquer. But this meant Westwood Studios had to create its own story and lore for its new franchise. According to Joe Bostic, a programmer and designer who worked on Dune 2 and who would work on multiple Command & Conquer titles, the team originally had wanted a high fantasy Wizards & Warriors setting very similar to Blizzard's Warcraft, although Westwood Studios had not been aware of Warcraft at that time. However, Sperry, who was again working as producer on this new project, decided that a modern warfare theme would work better. The Gulf War had boosted interest in the military, a trend that is also visible in the simulation genre, where there were many attack fighter and chopper games made throughout the 1990s. Sperry wanted to build a strategy game that riffed on how modern technology was changing warfare. Lewis Castle, the other co-founder of Westwood Studios, told Computer and Video Games that, quote, We wanted players to imagine that their computer at home was a terminal to a real battlefield that communicated directly with your units in the field. 
While Dune 2 in Command and Conquer would have many similarities in their interface design, CNC added a high-tech, modern polish that of course included the night vision green that no military game in the 1990s could go without. And the changes, they were more than just skin deep. Command and Conquer added its own version of drag select that didn't require pressing a keyboard shortcut beforehand. It also let players select more units and assign groups of units to keyboard shortcuts that could be recalled later. This made large groups of units a lot easier to control than they were in Warcraft. Westwood would also flex its artistic side by creating live action cinematics and rendered CGI shorts. Today these are best known for their campy qualities but the goal was to provide a cinematic experience. I hope I can trust you with this. GDI has stolen the plans and only prototype of our most valuable weapon. I call it Ezekiel's wheel. Essentially, it's a stealth tank. Get it back. Castle, again speaking to a computer and video games, said that, quote, we had no illusions that we were as good as TV or film. We weren't settling for campy, we just happened to be campy because we weren't professional at making videos. Sensing that the team needed some guidance from someone with acting experience, Westwood Studios turned towards Joseph Kukin. He had done voice acting work on the Legends of Corandian game and also had extensive theater experience, so he seemed like a great fit for the role. Kukin is best known today for his depiction of the iconic villain Kane but he also took on the casting and direction roles for Command & Conquer. While the live action sequences in Command & Conquer come off as a bit campy, they really threw down the gauntlet for Blizzard, raising the bar on narrative and backstory. At this time, Warcraft really had just a threadbare plot. It wasn't at all like the extensive lore we know today. And it's quite possible that we wouldn't have seen such an expansion in the lore of Warcraft in a lot of other real-time strategy games, many of which included their own live action or CGI cinematics, if Command & Conquer had never decided to go that route. Multiplayer, however, would become the defining feature of Command & Conquer. Although local play was the only option officially supported, there were third-party services now available that could allow online play with people across the country or the globe by fooling the game into thinking it was being played locally. Command & Conquer also shipped with its own disc sharing feature, which meant if you had many friends and only one disc, you could still play competitively over a local network. Command & Conquer was the first real-time strategy game to receive massive hype and anticipation before its release. The game was featured in multiple previews, including cover stories for Computer Gaming World and Computer Game Strategy Plus. The game sold 1 million copies in just one year, which you might remember is four times the 250,000 copies that Dune 2 had sold over three years. This far exceeded the sales of Warcraft as well, which made it very clear that Westwood Studios was still the company to beat in the real-time strategy genre. Blizzard was also very busy during the development of Command & Conquer. Facing pressure from Davidson & Associates, the company's owner, they went into a sequel, Warcraft 2 Tides of Darkness, at breakneck speed. While there was still some internal debate about the theme with some suggestions that modern or sci-fi elements should be added to the franchise, the team quickly settled on a more is more approach for Warcraft 2. Warcraft 2 Tides of Darkness added naval and air units. It also expanded the game's lore, giving the opportunity to add units from races allied to the originals humans and orcs. It also introduced a third resource, oil, added a map editor, and eliminated some finicky elements like the need to place buildings adjacent to roads, which was present in the original Warcraft. The fog of war was tweaked so that sight would no longer persist once units left an area. Also, the drag select feature for multiple units was changed, the maximum number of units was up to nine, and the need to hold down the control button was eliminated, so it worked much as in Command & Conquer. One thing that didn't change from the original Warcraft was a focus on multiplayer, as the short single-player campaign was a common area of criticism from game reviewers at the time. Though multiplayer was still limited to local play unless you used a third-party service, reviewers were enthralled by the game's large and complex battles, which could include up to several dozen units at once. Released in December of 1995, just three months after Command & Conquer, Blizzard's game was still very much an underdog. 
It was mentioned in game magazines like Computer Gaming World and PC Format, but these blurbs were tiny compared to the massive coverage that Command & Conquer had received before its launch. Still, the game moved 300,000 units within the first 10 days of its release, and it would go on to sell 1.2 million copies within its first year. Those numbers put Blizzard on even footing with Westwood Studios for the first time. Westwood followed up on the success of the original Command & Conquer at record pace, delivering Command & Conquer Red Alert just 14 months later in November of 1996. While its gameplay was similar to its predecessor, Red Alert released with a map editor, and it also came with a program called Westwood Chat, an online chat application that had at first been released alongside Westwood's version of Monopoly that came out in 1995. Westwood Chat let players organize lobbies and connect to multiplayer games by sharing IP addresses, finally giving an official first-party solution to multiplayer. Red Alert sold even better than the original Command & Conquer, moving an amazing 1.5 million copies in its first four weeks. That overshadowed even the success of Blizzard's Warcraft 2 by a long shot. Command & Conquer Red Alert was plastered all over gaming magazines, cover stories, features, and plenty of advertisements. You simply could not miss it. Both Blizzard and Westwood followed up the success of their games with expansions. Blizzard had Beyond the Dark Portal, which added two new, fairly lengthy campaigns, as well as new units, maps, and etc. Red Alert's expansions, Counter-Strike and Aftermath, had some single-player missions, but were more focused on multiplayer maps and units and they were co-developed by a studio in London called Intelligent Games. By the end of 1996, the competition between Blizzard and Westwood was heated. Both studios were now extremely successful, and it was clear that multiplayer was a big part of that success. That led each studio to pursue a multiplayer-focused strategy, which would work out extremely well for one of them, and not so great for the other. Blizzard's founders met David Brevik, a co-founder of Condor Studios, at CES in 1995. Both studios were working on versions of a game called Justice League Task Force, a competitive fighter for consoles. Blizzard was working on the SNES version, while Condor was working on a version for Sega Genesis. But this wasn't the only game that Condor was working on. It was also working on a role-playing game called Diablo. Blizzard's co-founders saw it and they were interested, so much so that they would eventually offer the buyout Condor Studios. Condor accepted the offer and would become Blizzard North. So what does this have to do with the history of real-time strategy games? Well, Diablo would launch alongside a new free service called Battle.net. This was a big deal. Prior attempts at connecting players, like Westwood Chat, were really just chat applications that let players share their IP address. Battle.net skipped the hassle and launched into a game directly. Originally operating off a single computer in Blizzard North's office, it was available alongside Diablo in 1996. Westwood was not sleeping on multiplayer either. Westwood Chat eventually evolved into Westwood Online, a service that also put online connectivity directly into Westwood games. It was promoted alongside Soul Survivor, a new online-only game in the Command & Conquer universe. Soul Survivor was heavily hyped, including a cover story in the February 1997 issue of Computer Gaming World. The game was essentially a battle royale. Players started with one unit and tried to kill everyone else with match sizes of up to 50 players. Most people don't remember Soul Survivor today because it was unfortunately a pretty big flop, perhaps the worst that Westwood Studios had experienced up to that point. Next Generation Magazine gave it a one-star review because of persistent lag that made the game unplayable. Computer Gaming World was more charitable, giving it three and a half stars and insisting the core concept was solid, but also complained of, quote, lag times that effectively paint a target on your back. To make matters even worse for Westwood, the studio's next big RTS game in the Command & Conquer universe, Tiberian Sun, was being delayed time and time again. Originally anticipated for 1997, it would be pushed all the way back until August of 1999. That left a massive hole in Westwood's schedule, one that Blizzard would use as an opportunity. The momentum of the RTS genre would finally shift 
definitively in Blizzard's favor with the release of StarCraft. The name of the game suggests a link with Warcraft, and this is more than just a marketing ploy. As I'd said previously, early versions of Warcraft 2 toyed with the idea of adding modern or sci-fi technology to the game. Artist Stu Rose was opposed to the idea, but Blizzard co-founder Alan Adham was in favor. Rose had mostly won this argument when it came to Warcraft 2, though the game did add oil as a resource and include some steampunk elements. But Adham's desire remained, and he hoped Blizzard could adapt the Warcraft engine to a new sci-fi universe. The project kicked off with Chris Metzen becoming lead designer for StarCraft, a title he shared with James Finney, who earned a big promotion from Tester on Warcraft 2. At this time, Blizzard's upper management, including Adham, was under a lot of pressure to keep revenues growing. Blizzard had been acquired by Davidson and Associates in 1994, and that company was then acquired by another company called CUC International in 1996. This added a new layer of executives that were looking to profit from their new acquisition. Adam's original idea was to turn around StarCraft in just one year by leaning heavily on the Warcraft engine. However, plans changed when a demo of StarCraft shown at E3 1996 bombed hard with many panning it as nothing more but orcs in space. Work on StarCraft came to a halt as Diablo neared completion. Although developed by Blizzard North, Diablo's final march toward launch pulled in talent from Blizzard South. Patrick Wyatt, writing on his personal blog, said that, quote, As Diablo grew in scope, eventually everyone at Blizzard HQ, artists, programmers, designers, sound engineers, testers, worked on the game until StarCraft had no one left working on the project. Once Diablo shipped, Blizzard returned its attention to StarCraft, but the competition was growing by the month. It seemed like every studio in the world wanted to make an RTS game. Clearly, this turning Warcraft into orcs in space was not going to work, and Blizzard decided to reboot the project. StarCraft would ship with three races instead of two, and unlike most games, they would be entirely asymmetric. The campaign was lengthened, with Blizzard focusing on high-quality 3D rendered cutscenes, and extensive voice acting was added to missions. StarCraft would also use Battle.net, Blizzard's free online service, which had kicked off with the release of Diablo. The game would even include an awesome level building tool that would rank among the most capable released for any RTS game ever. Maps made in StarCraft eventually spawned an entire genre, the MOBA, which although made popular by the defense of the Ancients map for Warcraft 3, first appeared in a custom map for StarCraft called Aeon of Strife. Now, expanding the game to keep up with expectations was not easy. Everyone involved with the project seems to agree that development of StarCraft was complete chaos. Chris Metzen, speaking on BlizzCast Episode 2, described the game's story as a constant work in progress. He said that, quote, A lot of that stuff, referring to the game's campaign and lore, wasn't clear from the get-go. We were just making the broadest science fiction universe we could and trying to make sure it really resonated with people. According to Patrick Wyatt, the game was a buggy mess throughout much of its development, so much so that playtesting in the game was sometimes completely impossible. Bob Fitch decided to reboot the game's engine in February of 1997 in hopes of squashing some of the more persistent bugs, but this set the project even further behind its intended schedule. Blizzard had originally hoped to ship the game by the end of 1996, that slipped to the middle of 1997, then holiday 1997. StarCraft finally arrived on March 31st, 1998, and the delays had only heightened anticipation for the game. Computer Gaming World made a preview of StarCraft, the cover story of its May 1997 issue, then gave it number one billing on a list of 40 upcoming strategy titles in the November issue. The game also appeared in cover stories from PC Powerplay, Next Generation, The Game's Machine, and Ultimate PC, among others. Despite the delays, the revisions, the bugs, and a year and a half of grueling crunch, none of the project's problems were obvious when StarCraft was released. The game was praised in basically every review written about it, and by the end of 1998, it had won multiple Game of the Year awards. StarCraft went on to be the best-selling PC game of 1998, and the best-selling real-time strategy game of all time, a title that it still holds to this very day. There could be no doubt, Blizzard was the new king of real-time strategy.
While Blizzard crunched on StarCraft, Westwood Studios was working on its next RTS game, although encountering some problems of its own. The studio's new Command & Conquer game, Tiberian Sun, faced really a problem that was opposite of what Blizzard had faced with StarCraft. While StarCraft was not ambitious enough and had to be expanded, Tiberian Sun was too ambitious, and it faced issues with feature creep and conflicting project schedules. Eric Yeo, a lead designer on Tiberian Sun, wanted the game to push the real-time strategy genre in a new direction. In an interview with Jeff Keighley of Game Slice, yes, that Jeff Keighley, Yeo said, quote, Everyone has done head-to-head -head unit combat to death, so the idea here is to give players other options. If you're at a disadvantage, use the terrain, burn the forest down, shoot down the bridge, and make the environment tougher for your opponent. To accomplish all of this, the next Command & Conquer game needed to have destructible terrain, a weather system, and dynamic lighting with a day-night cycle. But interactions between these systems caused problems. Destructible bridges led to severe pathfinding issues. As a result of this, that feature took 10 times as long to program as was originally estimated. As with prior Command & Conquer games, Westwood created its own video compression technology in-house. This allowed Westwood to keep ahead of the curve, delivering cinematics that were sharper, with 24-bit color depth and a 15 frames per second presentation that was smooth for the standards of 1999 at least. Westwood also had the chance to hire star Hollywood talent like James Earl Jones. However, casting Hollywood stars meant working with their busy schedules. This left the cinematics team, which was led by Donnie Meal, who shared co-direction credits with Joseph Kukin, to pick up the pieces after shooting was already completed. Unfortunately, the team found that it had greatly underestimated the storage and network capabilities required to handle its production workflow. The team also found that the compositing system that it used needlessly inflated file sizes. Because of these technical issues, a simple change that should only require a few seconds of work would instead require minutes of time, as the cinematics team had to wait for files to transfer to or from the company servers. Though initial design for Tiberian Sun started right after the shipping of Command & Conquer in 1995, and design was finalized in 1997, these technical issues would push the release date of the game all the way back to August of 1999. That's three years after the release of Red Alert. Still, despite the delays, fans were eager to get their hands on a new Command & Conquer game, which drove sales to 1.5 million units within its first year. However, this commercial success was met with more mixed critical reception. GameSpot reviewer Greg Cassavin liked the game, giving it a 79 out of 100, but said it, quote, rather shamelessly borrows unit designs from competitors like StarCraft and Dark Reign. Next Generation gave the game a 3 out of 5 star review, slamming it for a lack of innovation. Computer Gaming World was more charitable, praising the game for its excellent multiplayer, Good Mission AI, and great map generator, but called the game's cinematics video schlock. Tiberian Sun was followed by Command & Conquer Red Alert 2, which, like the original Red Alert, was very well received by fans and also sold extremely well. It became the 13th best-selling PC game of the year 2000. Still, despite this, the release of Tiberian Sun and Red Alert 2 did not reclaim Westwood's throne from Blizzard. The games sold quite well, but they were overshadowed by StarCraft, and in particular by the hugely successful and well-received Brood War expansion that came out in 1999. In addition to that, Westwood was dealing with internal issues as its future projects shifted from genre to genre and seemed to lose the studio's original focus. A string of commercial flops from the studio, which included a first-person shooter set in the Command & Conquer universe, Renegade, led to the closure of Westwood Studios by Electronic Arts. EA had bought the studio in 1998, but in 2003, during a company reorganization, it was shut down, with remaining staff moved to Los Angeles. Of course, that's not to say Command & Conquer ceased to exist, or that its legacy is not remembered. Former Westwood staff that remained with EA and moved to Los Angeles worked on future Command & Conquer games like Red Alert 3, which was quite well received. Although they also worked on other games like Tiberian Twilight, which was pretty broadly hated by both reviewers and fans of the franchise. Some former Westwood staff, like for example Joe Bostic, 
stayed in Las Vegas and decided to form their own studio called Petroglyph Games. After developing over a dozen games, including real-time strategy titles like Star Wars Empire at War, Grey Goo, and 8-Bit Armies, Petroglyph Games was reunited with the Command & Conquer franchise for the 2020 remaster of the original game. This led to quite a bit of renewed interest in Command & Conquer, so who knows, maybe we'll see a remaster of other Command & Conquer games, or even finally a new proper title in the franchise, and by that I mean not a mobile game. But I guess we'll just have to wait and see. In any case, Westwood Studios was not able to keep up its competition with Blizzard, which would go on to release the much beloved Warcraft 3, as well as eventually Starcraft 2. Though, unfortunately for RTS fans, uh, Blizzard has not been able to use those successes to its advantage in the RTS genre as of late, and it doesn't look like Blizzard has any plans for a real-time strategy game anytime soon. Who knows? Maybe this really is the right time for a revival Command & Conquer. After all, Blizzard, like Westwood back in the late 1990s, has left quite a gap in its schedule for real-time strategy fans. Now, as always, the sources for this video are linked in the description below. So if you want to research this topic a little bit on your own, please do go check them out. I think you'll find a lot of interesting information there. You'll also find a link to my Patreon where you can help ensure there will be more in-depth historical videos about PC gaming in the future. And with that, thanks for watching, and I will see you next time. Building. Oops. Infantry.